Come on. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Um, my name is Aaron Patterson. You probably know this from the schedule. Uh, I work at Red Hat. You probably also know this from the schedule. Um, so I am a new employee here, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. I'm on the Manage IQ team, which is awesome. I'm really happy to be on this team. Um, I love cats. That's me and my cat. We hug a lot. It's fun having a cat. If you don't have one, I recommend getting one unless you're allergic, then don't. Uh, I'm on the Ruby core team. I'm also on the Rails core team. And this doesn't mean I know what I'm talking about. It just means I'm terrible at saying no. And I will go into that in a little bit more detail later. My badness at saying no. I love enterprise software. Um, I've been working on enterprise software for quite a long time on systems like this. Enterprise. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this, is what, this is what it's going to be like for an hour. So, so, sit. so please, sit back and enjoy yourself. Uh, my name is Tenderlove. I am Tenderlove on Twitter, GitHub, Instagram, and also Yo. So if you want to Yo me, that is, that is my name. Um, and probably if you've seen me online, like I don't look like this online, I look more like this on that <laughs> online, that's what I look like, so you might recognize me from that. Uh, my email address is here, abepatters at redhat.com. I'm trying to get this email address. Uh, it's hard. Yeah, so I, I, emailed, I emailed the thing, I put, in a, I put in a request, I was like, hi, can you please change, give me an alias to tenderlove at redhat.com. Well, no, first I emailed, hey, I, the people help desk, I was like, I need, a, I need an alias, and they're like, oh, we can help you with that. No problem. So I responded, I'm like, great, can I have tenderlove at redhat.com, and they're like, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we, need a, we need a business case for this. So I responded, and I'm like, well, that's what everybody knows me by on the internet. Please, just do it. And I, I don't actually have this address yet, I don't think. But they, it says approved. Like, I've looked at the process thing. It says approved, but nobody's actually done it yet. So I might need to, like, bump that issue. I had to threaten to quit to get Purple Idea at redhat.com. You had to do what? Threaten to quit. Really? Like, if you want me to stay, I would like my alias that everyone wants to be by. So, like, just threaten to quit. So okay. Okay. Two weeks in. Okay. Come on. <laughs> so um, anyway, yeah. So this is a, this is how I'm known on the internet. Like most people know me this way. Um, and I want to tell, like, I want to start this off telling a little story about my parents, uh, since we got an hour to kill here, right? Uh, so I tell my parents about everything I do, like I'm a programmer, all this stuff, but I never have told them this name, right? I've never told them that that's what I. That's like what I go by on the internet. And this year there was, a, there was a conference in Utah. I grew up in Utah and there was a conference there and the organizer asked me if I would come fill in. Somebody canceled. The organizer is a former coworker of mine. And I was like, yeah, you know, I'd like my parents to see me and give a talk sometime. So, uh, you know, I'll be, I'm happy to come speak, but give me two extra tickets for my parents to come watch. And the organizer was like, absolutely, no problem at all. So I go, go to the conference and I bring my parents along and we meet the organizer and the organizer's like, okay, um, we've got three seats reserved for you down at the front. So we go down to the front and there's three seats and there's a sign on each seat and the first sign says tender love, the next sign says tender mom, and the next sign says tender dad. And I'm just like, oh no. I have to explain it to them now in front of people. <laughs> so I had to be like, okay, I, I just told my parents, I was like, look, there's this name, this is what everybody knows me by on the internet, like, just be cool, people are going to talk to you about it, like, just don't worry about it, don't worry about it. So, anyway, they haven't asked me about it since, <laughs> which is good, I think. Um, so I'm the number one contributor on Rails, that is, that is me, I probably have more commits than that now, I have a lot of points on the internet thinking about exchanging these for uh, gifts. I'm not sure which website you do that at, but there is, I'm pretty sure there's a place for it, similar to Airline Miles. Um, but there's actually a secret to getting to be the number one committer, okay? And I'm gonna tell you all what that secret is because I know all of you can do it too. Uh, the way that you 
get the most points is you need to know that revert commits count too. <laughs> so really what the lesson here is that more mistakes means more points. So the more mistakes you make, the higher you can get, and soon you too will be the number one commander. <laughs> um, let's see more about myself. I'm a short stack engineer. Um, yes, pancakes. Uh, I love pair programming. This is me pair programming. <laughs> See, I've got a pair there that's an action shot of my pair. Um, it was really hard to get the TTY working, it was a bit sticky. Um, I got a cat, I showed you that earlier. His name is Gorbachev. Puff Puff, Thunder Horse, that's his full legal name. Um, and I got another cat, her name is SeaTac Airport YouTube, Facebook too, I think. Um, and we can talk about why that is later. And her natural habitat is on top of my laptop there. So, I don't know why, but she likes programming. Anyway, I am new here. I'm very new here at Red Hat. I've only been working here for four weeks. And in that four week time, I want to show you what I've been doing. Um, I live in Seattle, which is right here. So, the first week of my employment at Red Hat, I came all the way over here to the East Coast, and then I flew back to Seattle. And then I was at home in Seattle for two days, and then I went to Tokyo and came back, and I was home for one day, and then I went to Moscow and came back, and I was home for a day. Uh, then I went to Brussels, and I lost my passport here, <laughs> and came home after that, and now I am here. So I am a little bit jet lagged. I am very tired, so there may be, and I am new, so there may be mistakes in this presentation. Okay, just <laughs> FYI. Uh, today we're going to talk about upgrading to Rails 4x, we're going to talk about upgrading uh, Manage IQ to Rails 4x, but really I want to talk about upgrading to Edge Rails because actually I'd like to get, um, I'd like to get us up on to Edge. So basically the idea is get us up on a 4.0 and then finally get us up on the Edge Rails. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the Rails release timeline because this impacts our, this definitely impacts our upgrade, our upgrade schedule. Um, 4.2 is not out yet, but it will be very soon, uh, pending some security issues that I have to fix. Um, but 4.2 will be out very, very soon, and I want to get us up to that. And the next one after 4.2 is 5.0. So uh, that's really why I want to get us up on edge rails, is so that we can keep up with any like any stuff that we're going to be deprecating or removing in 5.0, so I want to make sure that we, we stay caught up with that, so that when we do actually have to, you know, say, change our dependency to Rails 5.0, it, it'll just be a simple, like, okay, <coughs> change the gem file, we're good to go, right? So, upgrading Rails, the uh, first thing I want to talk a little bit about is why we want to upgrade Rails. Uh, like what are the benefits for us upgrading Rails? One of the main benefits are performance. Uh, with Rails 4.2, I've done a lot of, so I typically focus on performance issues in Rails. Uh, in 4.2, I've got a project in there that speeds up active record in many cases by like 2x or so. So we get a lot of performance as we upgrade. Um, I don't have the graphs included in this in this slide, but we've also basically halved memory usage as well. So we're increasing performance and decreasing memory usage. So this will help us with load on our servers. Um, ah, right, slide about memory reduction. So we're also reducing memory, again, helping us out with servers. Uh, also, I, I think staying on staying behind costs us. So we've got like we've got a fork running currently running a forked version of Rails. Like we've got this version of Rails and we've got patches applied against that fork. And unfortunately that costs us money. And the reason it costs us money is because anytime we need to upgrade, now we need to take a look at those patches and say like, well how do we apply those to the new version of Rails? So I want to get us off of that fork so that it is not expensive for us to upgrade in the future. Um, oh I didn't have a slide in here for this, but also if we are staying behind on a fork like this, we might miss out on security fixes. So we don't want to be backporting those things all the time. It'd be nicer to just push all this stuff upstream and have somebody else deal with it. Unfortunately, somebody else means me, typically. But <laughs> at least it's like we've got another team that can do it too. 
Um, so I'll talk about a little bit about how I'm going to do these, how I'm going to make these changes. Uh, so we'll look at like what we have in the system today and what I want to do with all those changes in the system today, like how we'll get off of this fork. Uh, main thing is that we're going to push things upstream, so anytime we can, we'll take any changes that are on our fork and actually push them into Rails itself. Uh, if we can't do that, maybe we'll move, it, move that stuff to a new gem. Uh, these are just different strategies that I have for getting us off of that fork. Uh, so we'll move stuff to new gems, and we may have to change the implementation. Like, so we might have a we might have a patch applied to Rails, and we can't upstream that or put it in a gem, so we'll just, we just need to change our code. It's the way we handle that particular situation in our code. Uh, this is the one I, I would like to avoid this one, if at all possible, because I think this is actually, this is probably more expensive than the other ones. Like, pushing stuff upstream is best. Extracting to a gem is second best, I think. And I think this is, like, I want to avoid this one at all costs, if possible. Uh, so issues today, I want to look at all the changes that we have inside of our Rails fork and uh, what we're going to do about each of them. So which techniques will apply to those particular changes. I want to talk about what it is, what it is we have in the fork, what that thing does, and how we're going to deal with that moving forward. Uh, so we've got a lot of Rails monkey patches. Um, and I'm not a huge fan of monkey patches. Uh, except for the case, like I want to call this out for a little bit. Uh, I'm generally not a fan of monkey patches, but it's okay if you're extending particular features. So for example, if you look at our fork, we've got a lot of stuff that provides uh, statistics about postcards, right? So it's like querying, querying uh, the database for statistics about postcards, and we're extending the active record gem to do that. But the important thing, we're, and we're monkey patching it in order to do that, but the important thing is that those monkey patches are A, just adding new methods, and B, the implementation of those methods is only depending on uh, public facing methods, right? So the place where we really get into trouble is if we're monkey patching and we're doing it on internals. So we want to avoid touching any internals if at all possible. Uh, so let's dive into the things we have in our Rails fork and what we're going to do about those things. Uh, first thing we have is the active record object allocation time. So if you look inside of our fork, you'll see a bit of code like this. And I've just, like, I deleted most of it just to make it fit on a slide. But we've added, actually, that line here, this benchmark, and then also this logging stuff. And what this is for is to measure how long it takes to instantiate active record objects. So when we fetch a bunch of stuff from the database, how long does it take to turn those rows into actual active record objects? And we log that. And unfortunately, we can't upstream this, this particular patch. Uh, the main reason we can't upstream it is uh, the rest of the team does not like the noise and the logs. So they're not happy about that. But what we're going to do instead is we're going to add active support notifications for this. So basically, we'll add hook points in there like that patch will turn into something that looks like this. So rather than doing rather than doing a log here, we'll just send this message. And then what we can do inside of our application is just subscribe to that and then output a log. So this makes everybody happy. Rails core team doesn't care because there's no there's no new messages in the logs, and we get the functionality that we want out of this. So we can upstream something like this? Absolutely. Yes, yes. So this is going to get this, I will apply this upstream, and then uh, what I'm going to do is apply this particular thing upstream, and then in our app, I'm going to add something like this, where we just subscribe to that particular message, and then output the same logs that we had before. So then this stuff will, this stuff will stay stable going forward, and we don't have to worry about it. Uh, next thing is truncating tables. So if you look at our extensions, the active record, we have a method that's like go truncate a table. Um, this is all it does. It literally just truncates a table. Uh, I already pushed this upstream, so this is in this is already in Rails Master and should be released in 4.2. And in order to keep us from having to upgrade right now, uh, I added a monkey patch to backport. There's a pull request for this. I'm not sure if it's merged yet or not. Is it? Yeah. Maybe not. No. It's this. 
the, <laughs> that much left. Uh, so I've added a monkey patch for backporting, and once that gets merged in, basically what we'll be able to do is when we upgrade to Rails, once Rails has that truncate feature in there, it'll actually complain at us and say like, hey, please delete me. I'm no longer necessary. Uh, so that's that one. Uh, the next one is we have, we use 64-bit primary keys uh, in, our, in our tables in Postgres. Now we do that, the main reason we do that is for uh, sharding, I guess, is that basically we have, a, we have a particular prefix we put on that ID that says like, these records came from this particular database. 32 bits was too small, I suppose. Um, so we opted to 64 bits. What's interesting is in Postgres, when you say like create a table, add this column, an integer means 32 bits, where uh, big int means 64 bits. And unfortunately, in Rails, the default is 32 bits, right? And I, so I was like, why is this? Why is it um, 32 bits? So I asked everybody around on the core team, and basically the consensus was this. We don't know. Uh, so it's okay to change that. Uh, it's actually totally fine to change that. So we're gonna change the defaults, or that's one of the things I'm gonna do is change the defaults such that on Postgres, the default will be 64-bit 64 64-bit 64 integers. Now, some of the challenges with this is that if you take a look at uh, schema.rb, uh, so this is just you know a little bit of a schema.rb file. The problem with this code is that uh, there's no primary key declared, so we don't say what the type is for the primary key. So in our application, this code, oh, actually, this right here too, we have this dot integer. On a normal Rails application, that means 32 bits, right? But with our monkey patches, this means 64 bits. So the problem is I can't just push up the 64-bit change because everybody downstream from it that's not using our, our fork is going to have a messed up database. I, so I, I thought we specifically say big int there. Yeah, I thought we made that say big int. Does it? Yeah. yeah. I read our schema to I put this right out of our schema to our, our B file. I think the BK is defaulted to, to yes. begin under the cover, right, yeah. but then we say specifically <coughs> the T begin. So for us, really? we don't actually use the schema RB. So for us, it may not make a big deal. <laughs> right? Well, I mean, we, we, we can't we change from zero, zero, so yeah. We can't change, we definitely can't change the primary key thing. What we need right. to do this, what we need to do for this is, um, so I think that we can upstream this, but we need to determine our backwards compatibility scheme. And I think what we're going to do, or what I'm going to do for that is basically say, we need to start, I mean, what we really need to do is we need to start dumping the primary key information, right? We need to dump that, that needs to be put into the schema.rb file as that is a, an int, integer or a big int or whatever that thing is. And I think that's actually just, that's actually just a problem in general with the schema.rb file. I mean, some people have custom stuff declared against the primary key, like, um, Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unsigned. In fact, today, in fact, today, like right now, um, Rails supports or we support UUID, UUID primary keys. So we already have a system in place for doing that. It's just we don't do we don't do big ins right now. So we got to do. I gotta make the changes. So in order to get this out of our fork, I need to make the changes to dump the primary key information so that we don't break backwards compatibility with other Rails applications. Once I make that change, then we should be able to change it to uh, change Rails to just default to uh, big int primary keys, and then we can just delete our monkey patch completely. So there's no, uh, none of this code, well, I guess yes, all of this code will be upstreamed plus some additional stuff I have to do to dump the schema RB information. Uh, the next thing we have are default primary key sequences. So if you look inside our app, we have a YAML, I think it's a YAML file that has an integer prefix for the just primary keys. Flat text file. Flat, just a text file? Okay. Uh, and if you, go, if you do a diff on our branch against the tagged version, you'll see that this, this diff, if we go fetch some sequence start and then we do set PK sequence on, the, on that table. Now, I don't think that we can upstream this particular change. Um, 
mainly because other people use different techniques for sharding. For example, UUID, UUID primary keys. Uh, you can put prefixes on those things. So I'm thinking we have we have basically two strategies in this particular case. Maybe we want to investigate switching off of using this some like integer start value to using UUID primary keys, or we should just extract this and call super. Uh, now one thing, one thing, I think uh, the set, this call, this set PK sequence thing, I think that's actually our patch. I think we have that. That'll get upstream. We can add that. That's, that particular function is no problem. Really what I'm concerned about is monkey patching this into the migrations code and then this, this method here too. So I'm not sure that, I don't think we can upstream the entire thing here, but we do have a path going forward. So we can extract that and set su call super, or we can add some integration points inside of Rails and say like, okay, if you want to do some custom stuff in this area, we'll call out to a method and then we can add our custom stuff. Um, Next thing is auto reconnect. So we have a bunch of code for if the database goes away, what do you do, right? If the database goes away and you get an exception, how do we handle that? Uh, now this one is gonna be pretty tricky, I think, because it's supposedly fixed in master. So theoretically, we could just delete all that stuff and it'll work, but the problem is we don't really have any tests for this particular situation, so it's very difficult for me to verify whether or not our particular cases are fixed. Uh, one thing I found interesting though is if you look through if you look through our patches, we actually have this this patch in here that whenever we try to whenever we try to reconnect to the database, we actually log a log a value there. So I want to take a look at look at logs from production and see if this is actually a thing that's still biting us, right? And see what cases we're, we're hitting where we need to do reconnection. One thing that we have to do, or one thing that we do need to extract from this particular patch is that we don't have good exceptions in Active Record. So you can't tell, from the exception class, you can't tell whether it was a bad SQL statement, like maybe you gave the database a wrong SQL statement, or the database just went away. We can't tell the difference. It's just the same exception. Uh, so I think one thing we need to do is extract, extract that stuff we have for, or the code that we have for detecting um, database disconnects and add an exception in Rails so that when the database disconnects, we can get a specific exception that's saying like, hey, the database went away, uh, can you handle it? So I don't think all of that, I don't think all of that stuff needs to be upstreamed. But the um, oh the connection exceptions definitely do. So I don't know how clear that is. Clear as mud, right? Everybody gets it. Yes, of course. Uh, so we also have a lot of connection extensions too. Uh, and I was mentioning those earlier, like database or database statistics, like getting the PID, getting. Oh, I don't even remember all the methods in there, but there's a bunch of methods for getting statistics about your Postgres database. And it's like, it's really cool stuff, really cool info about Postgres. Um, but it's very, very specific to Postgres, so we can't really push those upstream into Rails. And in this case, I think that we should just create a new gem that's like a PG stats gem that'll just give us, just apply those methods to the uh, Postgres connection in Rails. This is the case I was talking about where, in this case, monkey patching is fine. We're just adding new methods to the connection adapter. Those new methods are just calling existing methods on the active record connection and returning to us some values about it. So really, it's just a gem that's storing um, some interesting SQL statements. <laughs> <laughs> so I think in this case what we'll do is we'll extract all those methods, put those into a gem, and then just release that to the public and we don't need to worry about that inside our app anymore. Um, next thing I think was interesting is we need to look at virtual columns. Uh, I actually think that the schema.rb stuff we were talking about earlier is going to be more challenging than this one is. Uh, virtual columns, just for people who haven't looked at it yet, 
you might see a call like this inside one of our models where we say like virtual call name and we give it a type and then there's also a, what is it, uses. Uses is the important one. So what this method does is it does, it has two responsibilities. Um, one of the responsibilities is declaring a column type for reporting. So that's where it says that type is string. So we use that data for reporting. It actually just, it actually just stores an object off with a name and a type on it. And we just use that in our reporting system. Uh, the other responsibility of this method is to declare what associations that method uses. So when you see a declaration like this one, it means that there is a method called name inside the model somewhere. And if it says uses, that means that the name method uses some relation that's on that active record object. So it's declaring it in advance. And the advantage of this is that when you call dot name, you don't need to know what the associations were that you need to preload. It already knows that for you. So it can automatically preload that stuff for you and we get a performance gain out. Um, now, what I think we need to do with this particular call, or this particular method is that, or excuse me, let me back up a second, that uses part where we automatically do the preloading, that's where we actually monkey patch rails, or where we patch rails to say like, hey, go automatically load this stuff for that particular name, right? So remember, we have two responsibilities, one is for report, a reporting system, the other one is for declaring the associations that that method uses. So what we need to do is we need to separate these two concerns. I think what we can do is take that, uh, take that declaration part and then push that upstream. So that's a problem we've had for quite a while. Everybody runs, everybody calls a method and everything is super slow and they're like, well, what is the magical includes thing or what, what includes call do we need to make to make this fast again? So we can keep those things together and it abstracts the caller from knowing that, knowing about that relationship. Uh, I actually think in the future we should be able to do that automatically in Rails so that you don't need to say like includes. Eventually I think that our virtual column or that, whatever we're going to call that method can just go away. But for now it's a very good solution. Uh, so extract the reporting code and then push up the relation declarations and yeah. So I think that's the solution to that patch. And I think that's most of the monkey patches, or not monkey patches, uh, patches we have against Rails in our fork. But I want to cover some of the other stuff that I think is a barrier for us to upgrade. And one of those things is RJS. I think our massive use of RJS is going to be a hindrance for us, uh, mainly because we've, we, the Rails team, has dropped RJS support. It's, it's gone. We don't have it anymore. Um, so I'm really excited about that Angular patch. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get that working. Um, but if we can't land the Angular patch right away, there's still a path forward. Um, for example, there's the jQuery RJS gem, which gives us RJS features using jQuery, and I know that is used by, so that's used by a company called Cookpad. Their app is as old as ours, and they use, so it's actually very interesting. Their app is a cooking app that's used by 50% of the women in Japan. <laughs> Okay, so that is the scale of their app. It is huge, uh, but they use they use this gem just fine. They have RJS in their system too, so uh, we can use that. Also, there's Prototype Rails, which which gives us the same functionality using Prototype. Uh, so we can use either of those gems and get our RJS upgraded. Other people I've talked to about, like actually I specifically talked to the Cookpad folks about their usage of RJS because they're in a similar situation that we are, like how they're upgrading. Uh, and basically what they told me is they're slowly, they're slowly phasing out all the RJS. So they don't, they don't have a project that specifically targets all of it. They're just saying like, okay, whenever we work on this feature, if there's RJS there, that's the time to take out that technical debt. So maybe we want to go that direction. I'm not sure. I don't think that Angular patch covered all of our RJS usage. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> I think the patch would have been a lot bigger. <laughs> Um, so the other thing, just in general, like we have a lot of we have a lot of monkey patches against uh, core classes in Ruby, and I'd like to get rid of those if possible. But I think that's more of a long term long term goal. What I really want to focus on is getting us upgraded, up, uh, getting us off of our fork of Rails and upgraded to you know, well, four two or Edge or wherever we can go there. <sighs> Boy, so. Um, 
that's most of the stuff I have for have to talk about for upgrading us to edge rails. And I didn't think I could talk about upgrading to edge rails for an hour, and I did not. <laughs> but I have some other stuff that I wanted to talk about, like as a new person coming on, taking a look at our code base, and I, I just wanted to talk about some of the stuff that I was doing to look around, look around through this code. So the things that I did to, you know, as a first glance, first glance at the code base coming in, trying to figure out where things are, where pain points are. Uh, one of the things I really like to look at is churn. And what churn is, is how often is stuff changing in our code base? Like how often, how often are files changing? How often is a particular file changing? If one file is changing more frequently than another, than another file, uh, that file may be a pain point for us. And here is the super handy scripts. Just write this down. No problem. <laughs> I'll, post this, I'll post this later. Um, so anyway, all this does is it goes through our entire Git log and it says like, okay, it groups all the files by the number of changes that they have and sorts, or a number of changes and sorts them. So if you run this command, you can see, you can get a list of all the files in our system and which one has been changed the most, ordered by which one has changed the most. And so if you run this, you'll see like, this is the output from it. I thought, I actually thought this one was really interesting. This is the one with the most churn app controller's application, and it is a file that does not exist anymore. Um, I thought that was interesting. It just got moved. Uh, probably, yeah. So then the number two here is application helper. Uh, what I actually found interesting is that our churn, the amount of churn also matched fairly well to the length of the file. So the longer the file was, the more churn it is. Especially this one here. This one's oof. Uh, so the next thing I looked at, next thing I looked at when I came to the system was uh, cyclomatic complexity of the code in our system. And what this is, what cyclomatic complexity is, is a way to quantify code complexity. So what it does is it looks at all of the conditionals in your system. So if you have an if and an else, you know that's more like that's more complex than no if and else. Or if you have an if with two conditionals, then that's more complex than an if with one conditional, right? Um, and for that, I use a tool called Flog. I'm sure most of you have seen this before. Uh, but when I ran that, so this was our, this was mostly the output from that. Um, you know, number one was I don't know whatever these files up here. These were the most complex. And what's interesting about this number is you have to remember that this number it may be high, but that might not matter because the number is in relation to other things. So it depends on what that file does. Like if you have two separate files that are two separate programs that do the same thing, hopefully their number is going to be similar, right? So if one has, if they do the same thing, but one number is higher than the other, then you know you may have a problem with that. Uh, but the reason I was looking at this, what's, what's interesting at look, about looking at the cyclomatic complexity of files is if you take that complexity and you also take into account the amount of churn on that particular file, then you can kind of get an idea for how much that file is costing us, right? So we're making frequent changes to that file, and that file also contains code that is very complex. So we're spending a lot of money on that file, and I think the number one here is our application helper, this guy. Like, this is in the top, I think this is the top seven. Top seven complexity, and also, uh, you saw previously like top churn, so application helper is costing us a lot of money. So we should probably start looking at refactoring that thing. Um, another fun thing I was doing was static analysis on our system. Uh, so we have some tools for doing static analysis on the system, like Breakman. What that do, what that is doing is taking a look at all of our code. And when I say static analysis, what that means is it's just looking at the code without running it. Right, so it's static. Uh, and it's trying to learn things about our code base based on, based on the text and the files without actually running anything. So that's what Breakman does, and it tries to report security issues to us. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to try and find unused methods. And I was pretty sure I could find some, because when I went, ran rake stats, I saw the system had maybe 150,000 lines of code. So I figured there must be something in there we don't use. 
<laughs> Probability seems very high. There's stuff that we don't use. Um, and for that, I use I use Ripper, and this ships with the standard library. So I just wanted to go over how to use Ripper because I think it's it's just really fun. I like I like using this thing. Uh, and Ripper is a Ripper is a Ruby parser. It parses Ruby code. And what's interesting about Ripper is it's actually based on the yak file that ships inside of Ruby itself. So it's using the same grammar that Ruby uses for parsing the code, right? If you go look in the dot, the yak file, there's actually a bunch of, you'll notice like a bunch of if defs for Ripper stuff. So it'll be like, oh, if we're compiling this for Ripper, then we want to call out to a Ruby method. But if we're compiling this for Ruby, then we actually want to just do compilation. We don't want to do, we're not calling out to any Ruby methods. So if you look in parse.y, you'll see these Ripper comments. And the way Ripper works is when it parses a file, it just calls some, it calls methods on an object depending on the token that it parsed. So you write, you use it like this. You'd say like, okay, subclass Ripper, and any time it finds a def, it'll call this on def with the name, like the name of the method, and other information about it, like I think, I don't know, arguments or some other stuff. Uh, so then you just say like, okay, instantiate a new parser with some code, and then you call dot parse, and every time that hits a def statement, we get a callback. Uh, so what I did is I wrote this thing. It's I don't know if you can read it or not. It's not very long, but what it does is every time it finds a def or a def on a singleton, like self dot def, uh, and every time it finds a method call or a function call or a symbol, so a function call being like a something dot something. Um, it calls these things, and I also, I also looked for uh, constant dot call and also just straight up symbols. So I assumed that any time we saw a symbol in our code base, that was actually a method that we're using. Uh, so I could say like, okay, find all the methods, then find all of the all the method calls and see if we can find any in there that aren't being used. Now, unfortunately, this doesn't work. Uh, and one of the challenges with this is like our ERB templates is one example one example of a challenge with this. But I added some code in there too. I, what we can do is we can actually invoke the ERB compiler and compile the ERB to Ruby code because that's all it is. It's taking that ERB template, turning it into Ruby code, and then executing it. So I can have it parse that, and I also put in one for Haml as well, so I can parse all the Haml files and check methods that we were calling. So with this, I could get a fairly good idea about what was being used and what wasn't being used. But unfortunately, unfortunately, there is a lot of code in our system that looks something like this, <laughs> which is a dynamic dispatch. We're dynamically dispatching to a method, and what that means is static analysis cannot find cannot find this. There's no way to find it. It just sees like virtual underscore and then some string interpolation has no idea. There's no idea, no way to do this. So uh, many of the methods that many of the methods that it reported as being unused actually were being used. And so I went through, like I didn't realize it was doing this dynamic dispatch, so I deleted a whole bunch of stuff. And then the test still passed. And <laughs> And then I figured out it was doing that dynamic dispatch, and I was like, oh, I guess we just don't have test coverage for that. Uh, but anyway, so static analysis plus Ruby is like uh, uh, kind of worrisome. And this is probably also why Breakman isn't perfect. Like that stuff, you know, I think I pointed out some stuff on our mailing list that was like, oh, we need to fix this stuff. It was just stuff Breakman couldn't find. And some of it's due to static analysis being so difficult. Um, and I want to say, so, I don't know, how's that stuff? I kind of want to end here saying, like, this, this summit is great. Like, I'm really happy to be here. I'm, I'm really excited that we're at this summit. And one of the main reasons I'm so excited about this is because of the communication that we're having here. Like, the entire team, people we're working with, uh, other, you know, community people here. And we're all getting together and talking about this. And one of the reasons, like, I want to share something that happened yesterday that made me extremely happy. Uh, so one of the things I was looking at in our system, I just happened to run across this, is 
Uh, if you look at some of the forms in our system, very frequently what they do is uh, we have like our browser, you know, a person using the site with our browser, and we have our web server, and we have a memcached server. And you'll notice that as people are typing stuff in the forms, like every time somebody hits a character, the browser hits the web server, and then the web server records that data into memcached. And then, of course, that comes back to the web server, and then that goes back to the browser. And this happens every time you hit a key in the form. Well, that's not, not totally quite, true. Not it happens every 500 milliseconds. Totally. It happens, it happens. Yes, but it's still every 500 milliseconds we are writing to the memcached server. And this is kind of crazy for me. I, I took a video of this. Um, so right over here, like this is our form. And every time we edit it, you can see here we're doing we're hitting the database, hitting the web server, and hitting our memcached, memcached server. And the reason that we're doing this, okay, come on video, that's cool. Everybody can see it going, that's nice. Okay, so what I wanted to show here, this is the web server requests, this is our interaction with the memcached server, and this is me filling out stuff in the form. So every 500 milliseconds, we're doing this fun round trip between all of these things. And the reason we are doing that is because we're trying to keep like, we're trying to keep the web browser, the state of that form, in sync with the state of the memcached server, right? So the idea is that we have two different sources here. We have a source of information in the browser and a source of information in the memcached server. And we're trying to keep those two particular things in sync. And the reason we are doing that, I think, is because or the thought was that, what was it? If you leave the page and come back, you want to have the form partially edited. No. <laughs> that won't happen. Yes. Yeah. So, this is the reason that people gave me of why, like, this was, this was the problem. The engineering team was like, oh, this is why we do this. So, what was amazing was, yesterday, we were having this conversation, and you said, no, we don't need to do that. We don't need to do that at all. And I was just like, that is amazing. It means that we can delete that entire thing. No, I said that wasn't the reason. <laughs> oh. we, don't need we don't need to do that. Because yeah. we don't need to do that. And it never happens to Jason. The latest time so fast, it never happens. Yeah, I type so fast, less fiber bills. Yeah. I'm I, I, I really actually, slow time from him. Like, we had to change the delay because of him. Typing so fast. I was actually typing yeah. faster than it would write then to it the memcached. It, it would put the wrong. It would send the wrong password. Yeah. So I get send half, I get half my password sent into the form, and then it, so, so then nothing ever worked for me. So then we, we cannot <laughs> delete it because. Well, we can't delete it. The solution, type more slow. The reason it was there is is because we didn't know nothing about JavaScript to do it in JavaScript. So we used the handy dandy. Uh, I see. I see. And we needed to, to let the. I mean, the controller was the only one that knew the old versus the new. So he's able to compare that. And when they went back, they wanted to turn the buttons off, kind of thing. Yeah, right. Really yep. So that's the reason. So what we can get rid of it somehow. What I would like to do, and one of the reasons I'm so excited about this Angular patch, is because ah. we can, all this logic that's stored on the controller, we can actually just implement that in JavaScript, and then all this code can go away. That's why I'm excited about it. Yes. <laughs> so we can get rid of that. We can get rid of that. I mean, this has, this has huge benefits for us. This reduces the cache size. So we're not going to have to store as much stuff in the memcache server anymore. Obviously, we're not going to have any, any more round trips back to the server. Uh, our code complexity is going to go down. As I mentioned earlier, we can actually delete, delete a bunch of stuff there. We can deal with bugs. This will actually fix bugs for us. So I didn't take a video of this, but let's say you have that same page open in two different browsers. If you edit, if you edit one, or in two different tabs, if you edit one and then hit save on the other, it saves the one from this side. It doesn't save the one that you see on, see on this side. Uh, so we'll also reduce server load. And this, the most exciting to me is this every 500 milliseconds, like that'll just go away. We'll have one source of information, which is a browser. So the point of this that I wanted to bring up is that um, you know, we were thinking that the reason we had this was for this one particular use case, which turned out to not be true. It was, we thought we had this, we thought that all this complexity was there for some particular use case that, that it, it, wasn't, it just wasn't true. Uh, so I think one thing we really need to be doing is questioning our assumptions. So we shouldn't just talk among each other and say like, well, we're doing that because of the thing. 
just some some particular tribal knowledge. Like we shouldn't we shouldn't uh, take that as gospel the entire time. We should be asking like why, right? We should be asking why we have this particular behavior. And it's important to know that these business requirements, these things that we think are business requirements, aren't necessarily set in stone. If something is hard for us to change in the code. We should go back to the business people requesting that particular feature and try to explain to them why it's difficult. Try to find a common ground that we can say, like some sort of way that we can meet in a place and say, well, this is easier for us to implement, and maybe like we don't need to have this exact business use case. So if we can find some way to compromise, we can actually reduce our code complexity. Um, actually, that's everything I have today. So thank you, everyone. And if we have questions, ask anything, upgrading rails, code complexity, cats, <laughs> salami, I cure meats at home, we can talk about that. <laughs> no, I can't sell you any. Can I complain about rails, weird, uh, Ruby weird things? Yeah. I don't really understand this, this is a little off topic, but since why not? So for some reason, Ruby people like, align all of their um, equals arrow Hash, 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 hash rocket, thank mm -hmm. you, that's the word I was looking for. Um, and this drives me crazy because patches that are one line changes cause like six line diffs. Mm -hmm. And this is just really dumb and I don't know why this happens. Did somehow this get changed or someone fired? <laughs> like, it, so the only thing, it, you know, anyway, that's why. I don't know why this is done. I, people just do it, so people just do that, but I can tell you, I can tell you on uh, Rails, we don't accept pull requests to do that. Uh, because it, exactly like you said, it, in, it yeah. increases the size of the diffs. Yeah, yeah. So okay. that's cool. I didn't know that, but because uh, public people do it too, right? Because they were like, we should do what Ruby does. So there's like a whole like sect of public people, myself included, that just doesn't do that. Yeah. It doesn't follow that guideline. So part of the reason it's done is because casual reading of code later, when, yeah. you're, when you're not reading patches, right. it presents itself like a matrix of information. So it's, it's easier for your brain to put that together, like this, 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 right. this. When you don't do that, it ends up like this, and you can miss things. Right. Um, so it's meant the, for the later presentation. Stuff. Typically, I like patches, if I'm going to accept patches, right now I don't do it, but if, I would prefer if there was a one line change just for the addition, and then a style change after that comes as a separate commit altogether. So I can look at the thing in, in isolation. But then he's going to be top of the number for even more changes. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> he gets two well, So the, the, other thing, the other thing that we do, the other thing that we do on the on Rails core is we don't allow we don't allow style changes as pull requests. Only core team members are allowed to do are allowed to do style changes, and we actually do um, we try to avoid those mainly because of backporting. Like we have to optimize we have to optimize for backporting and. Doing style changes like that totally ruins backporting patches. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I mean, it's obviously it's a case by case basis. There's no set rule. But what that's I'm, what I'm hearing is that Joe R needs to do all the style changes. I heard it. Yep. Sure. <laughs> should have a bot that does it. It's, like, no, no, it. it's named Joe R. Uh, <laughs> we, we have a bot that finds it. Any other questions? I like Ruby people questions. That was good. I'm a Ruby person. <laughs> so how big is this journey? Or how big? Yeah, you know, getting us to of getting the magic you code base to the edge. That is a good question. I don't know. Um, is it measured in months and years and then like? Oh no! So it's measured in months. It should be less than less than a year for sure. Um, yeah, less than a year, but definitely maybe a months. Is step one get us to four two, step two get us to edge, or are you straight to edge? Um, if we get to four two, so four two is edge right now. Okay. Uh, but it, but it won't all. Right? No, no, no. So what I'm going to do. You get to so this might be 4.3 or, or something. Like yeah. That. What I'm going to do. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to target 4.0. Uh, and upgrading, so once we get it to 4.0, upgrading through the rest of the 4 series is actually pretty easy. So uh, hopefully, if I can get us to 4.0, then hopefully going the rest of the way to Edge will be 
no big deal. I'm hoping, so once we cut 4.2, Rails mas or Master will be 5.0, and I'm hoping that I can get this upgraded before there's any uh, backwards incompatible changes landed on Master. So um, that is why I need this to be measured in months. <laughs> sure. I, I was a little late to the, uh, the session. Um, I know there's a lot of code that maybe you already presented this. There's a lot of code that kind of uses the old active record syntax. Is that something that we can have to upgrade as well? Or like with, so. with colon conditions and a colon or something or other? No, that's fine. It's okay. fine. Wait, so you can do a session with or, where? where parenthesis, parenthesis, just colon where arrow. Yeah. Yeah. Condition. We have a, if if there's anything that's if there's anything that doesn't work, the, we have a backwards compatibility gem yeah. too. Oh, I see. So it's not a big deal to get us up onto 4.0 and even to edge actually with this. But at some point we really should upgrade those things as well to use the newer syntax. Yeah. Where yeah. possible. Yeah, but there's no that's not a barrier for us to upgrade. That's not a barrier. Yeah. 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 I was so really, nice, nice to have that must have. Yeah. I was really trying to address Barriers to upgrade here. So, we have a couple of um, um, method missing, like some of the method missing stuff has been deprecated. Maybe like find all by name and something. Yeah, we have that in all. Oh yeah, yeah the deprecated that. deprecated finders. Yeah, that that's a gem. We have a gem that takes care of that. It's fine. So we can convert that later. I found out you were right about schema RB. We do have integer in schema RB, but since we don't use it. Yeah, we never care. We, we have a big end in migrations, uh -huh. and then that gets converted to integer. Yeah, yeah, I'm telling you, it's a bug. It's a bug. Like, like, yeah, yeah, so it. when we added the patch for the big end slash 64 bit stuff, we just kind of isolated it to keep the changes minimum on the mm -hmm. fork. And since we never cared about schema RB, we never cared about the schema RB generator, because mm -hmm. so we just ignored it. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, if we were to upstream the whole thing, it's a bug. It's got to be, yeah. It's got to be there in incomplete. Yeah. In space, so up, <laughs> so upstreaming that like we can't just upstream the part that we have in there. We need to have both sides of the right, mm -hmm. both sides of the puzzle. But yeah, and I think there's actually more. There's a few other places like you use change table. We don't have big in support in there because um, we never needed it. Mm -hmm. And I know people have hit that, so they have to do like t dot integer limit eight or something to to fake it. Have you looked at the Postgres EXT gem? Mm -mm. Yeah, I remember coding up some of these fixes. Like also extensions, like if you add an extension to Postgres, it doesn't end, end up in the schema RV file. I remember adding that stuff over there. But yeah, it's a popular. So we have, we I know we have extension support because I had to do that for HStore. So yeah, that's why I ended it. Like, like, yeah, wow. Yeah, so that is. Some of the some of the stuff is there, and depending. So that's why I'm not I'm not totally sure if we're going to target or if I'm going to target 4.0 or 4.1 or 4.2 because there's some features that are there that we use that are just in later versions, so it might be easier to target on those. So I don't know. We'll see. But I expect that once we get near four, it should be fairly smooth sailing. <coughs> Another Ruby asked question. Yeah. If you want, just as well to help. Um, so, like, for software and stuff that has lots of gems and stuff, um, what do you recommend for, like, packaging and potentially something that even Thor would consume? Like, should we just say FPM and use FPM or making RBMs of individual gems and hating ourselves? Or what, what should we actually do? <laughs> I feel like something has to happen somehow. Someone has to buy. I think he's worried about kind of vagrant and puppet and how how it can all be played out. Oh well, the puppet people are moving away from Ruby, which is another okay. issue. But uh, uh, at least for like Fedora and like distros that have guidelines, we some like I use you know Funloader and um, RBM and things like that. That like it would be nice to have some way to get that sort of agile. That we do packages into the distros, so it's not all wrapped on. Honestly, I have no idea. I have to talk to packaging folks. Yeah. Like, I know the I know like packaging people, packaging people in a Ruby Gems team have not been right. super I don't know, cooperative or 
nice to each other. So I don't know. The, I don't know the good solution. I don't know. If you could bring harmony to the space. Uh, <laughs> 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 Lots of Friday hugs. <laughs> Well, I don't know. Like, I don't know if I can talk to, if I can get in touch with some of the packaging folks, then maybe I can. Because I don't, I don't actually understand what they require, what they need. So, I mean, there's different. Like, I'm not a packager at all. I hate right? But uh, there are different use cases, different reasons. But like, there's always pain somewhere. So it's either like pain and meeting all the use cases, but or no pain, but not meeting some. Right. And then like. There's a spectrum of like don't care to growl to your other goal. So it's like you know, it's, something has to budge somehow. Yeah. Otherwise it's just done, you know. One weird thing, so one weird thing about Ruby Gems is Ruby Gems allows you to have multiple versions of gem installed. Like that's fine, but I know in package package land that's like not a thing. <laughs> so I'm not sure how we can reconcile reconcile those particular things. I mean, for our application, like since we're shipping a, you know, an appliance basically, it doesn't really matter because we get to define what is there. But for normal people using RHEL, I don't know, I have no idea. I mean, I talked about this a bit, but like being an appliance and being a unique snowflake is actually like a downside in a lot of situations. It's nice for you guys, but it's not nice for other people. How's that? Because then you kind of have a, a, a homogenous infrastructure, right? Like all this stuff has RPMs, and I use like, a common base image, then over here, I have this special appliance. It's easy for your developers, but it's hard for DevOps and system engineers that want to not have unique special cases. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that hinders the adoption. It certainly makes me not want to use it. But, you know. mm. so, so deploying an image is. Yeah, it's terrible. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it, but it's not, sorry, I haven't tracked that. It depends on your use case and what. So, so that's like a single yeah. USP. Yeah. That's so it how depends. It's not like you share the view that you have. No, no, it's not. But there, anyways, there are different use cases and different reasons. But, uh, but if, you, so if you have RPMs, you can build an image. Whereas if you have an image, you cannot go the other way without doing nasty dip things. Well, but I mean, you still you have to have some way to reconcile that you're running. So you're running our app, which requires some particular library X, Y, and Z. And if you want to run a different app on the same machine that requires a different version of those particular yeah. things, you have to reconcile that some way. So that's a packaging problem. And like, so if you had some way of having multiple versions and packaging that worked, that would be okay because then you would know that this machine would not have package A and B because they would conflict. Like, like that's okay. That's expected. Mm -hmm. And you know, some people are thinking that Docker could sort of be cheated to use as sort of like a RPM plus plus. But anyways, this, there's a lot of many discussions in this field, and if you're strong in Ruby core and and somehow bring harmony to this, I think that is sorely needed. So I think one thing that's interesting, and Joe and I have worked on this a lot, yeah. uh, is that Bundler is actually doesn't play well with other package managers. And um, so you can't tell Bundler, don't use Ruby Gems, only look at my RPMs, or only talk to you know, the RPM uh, library. Um, if it could do that, I think you could bring some sort of harmony between the two. Um, the thing is, Bundler is not Ruby core. Right? It's, it's just a gem, essentially. And so what are you thinking? Like you have some gems that are RPMs and some that are not? Or Potentially. Um, or you could say, um, you know, I want to use my RPMs as the main source, and then I want to just, when I bundle uh, install, I only want to look at that, and I don't want to pull anything down. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to pull down the new changes because I haven't verified them, for example, or I haven't like vetted them out. Whereas I know RPMs and Red Hat's channels, they vetted them out. They know that these are OK. Yeah. So I only want to look at those. Mm -hmm. um, and That's I don't, at, from a meta, just, if you just look at data, I don't see what the difference is. Yeah, from right. an operations perspective, it makes much more sense to know what, what you're going to ship with, right? Right. Like what this thing has been tested with or validated with. Right. You know, I know I've worked with these. So we're, we're trying to fake it by doing like hard coding the, the version numbers. And it's really not flexible for development. It makes that really annoying. The thing I don't get, so the thing I don't really understand is, and I'm not a packaging expert. Mm -hmm. Makeup. Right. <laughs> uh, the thing I don't really understand is how to reconcile the multiple versions installed on a particular system. 
I mean, even if we consult, even if we consult RPMs only, you could still end up with a situation where you have two apps with conflicting. Right. So that's why I don't think RPM necessarily is the solution in its current state. But it could be that something like a local repo per distro, that like where the gems come from, could be like not a local, but a hosted repo in the. It's like the appliance or something. Right in the distro, <coughs> you want a solution or RPM worrying about these sorts of things because the Ruby, but also other programming languages and Go and things will need these things too, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. at some point, the, someone's going to have to do this. The other upside to a lot of the packaging for it, it doesn't really matter if it's RPM or Dev or whatever is then you can set dependencies on things that are not um, Ruby gems. Yeah. So I yeah. can say you know I can say the PG gem relies on PG being installed, right? Or libpg is there. You can't do that with Bundler right now, and that's a real right. downside. And like I said, if, if Bundler just looked at RPMs and said, hey, you know, I need these, and then resolved against that, I think it would be fine. And I, I don't see why that just the data layer couldn't be made consistent across all of them um, so that you could talk to wherever and pick and choose which sources you need. So. Uh, we've looked at trying to change Bundler, and I just don't get the code enough well, to do it. Uh, you we tried and, subclassing you and image, and I just I don't get that. <laughs> you and me both. Yeah, it's, it's a pain. It's complicated. Like we we had we kind of laid it out in our heads, and we've kind of gone down that path. But even if I figured it out, I don't even know how to like get this upstream or do anything with it. So honestly, if we had if I had input from or if I could get input from current packagers or whoever develops the packaging system like if we could hammer out the particular requirements that we have I I, I know people you can talk to. Yeah. Um don't want to leave the effort. Um, <laughs> sure. <laughs> You're right on that. So is this uh, related to the software collections and yeah. the environments? Yeah, it's yeah. kind of related to that. Yeah. yeah. So people in Fedora and X are trying to do different things as like rings and layers to add on. Yeah, stuff. yeah. This is the environments like, that's right. Really but like so coppers and software collections and things like that. But it doesn't it doesn't do away with the need to actually have to make 200 RPMs or 300 RPMs. So that problem, I think, needs to get solved somehow. So it has to be safe, it has to be reproducible, it has to be offline billable. It should be unbundled if it can, so that a security fix doesn't need to be rolled out in 100 different versions. So there are legitimate issues, but like, you know. You have to solve the one where you can have two versions of Ruby in the system. Essentially, but yeah, from like from our perspective, we, now we want to upgrade Ruby. We literally have to create 200 RPMs out of all the gems that we use, and it's we're not really thrilled about that. No one is thrilled with that, right? Like, yeah. I don't like making one RPM. And the funny part is, both of the RPMs have the same content, so there's really no reason why there just can't be one RPM pointed to by both of you spec file the change to say. Yeah, but it's the way it's all been structured now. It's where it gets installed to. Where it gets installed to, the layout of the directory, how it modifies Bundler. There's a Bundler modification in order to make it work. It's just so many hacks on hacks that it's like not, yeah. well, it's not upgradable. Can, can, can we just put it, really it into Hadoop? <laughs> <laughs> it's true Hadoop. that you have multiple <laughs> versions of dependency. Because yeah. we have uh, one database that's called RPM, and we have one database called Bundler. And, or gem file, depends upon kind of declare. But you have multiple versions, multiple different code libraries that are trying to manage dependencies. Mm -hmm. I mean, when Image Magic came out, right, and, and that was like a the Ruby world so difficult, Mac ports, you know, they, they, they wrote a version of it, the Homebrew wrote a version of it, because everybody was trying to manage these C dependencies. But they all and say it, the same thing. They all say, I need this. Right. Right? But it's hard to cross the gap. You said one of them you're talking in Ruby. Mm -hmm. And the other one, you say, I want to depend upon something in the like, written that, that's, more, that's, that's an extension, though. That's, that's an extension. Solvable yeah. Problem. yeah. That, that problem is, is that's legit. Solvable. That's solvable because you could make a gem or something that said, like, I specify in some gem file thing you did. This gem means that. Package. Some C package. Instead of gem, whatever, you just say C package. Or it could just be an extension to yeah, gem. extension to bundle or to, to bundle. Or read but that's else. only if you need to declare it at the bundle level. Right? RPM, you could just convert. I don't see why you couldn't just take it, the gem file, convert it to RPM, right? And then tack on whatever you need if you need these additional C dependencies. So then for whatever reason. A lot of, of the 200 packages that we have, I'm going to probably say about three need that. <laughs> they, but they end up in different directories. And so mm -hmm. we don't have a way for RPM to say I'm going to install this time in this directory and this time to this directory. Mm -hmm. Ruby's more flexible with that one, RPM's not. Mm -hmm. So just because of that idea where you're like, I want to 
put this in a set spot, you change the definition of the set spot, you know, you need a different RPM for that. Which actually, yeah. That comes back to your one, but is there only one allowed kind of thing. But is there a way for us to easily get like our gem spec, which is our hierarchy dependencies, get that into RPM? That's what we're trying to do. Not it's it's extremely difficult, and I don't right. understand why. <laughs> so then, that's it. We need to extend RPM so that it has the same features that and gem spec has. Or we need to limit gem spec so that it's, like, you know, we need a common ground. I think we need a crawl, walk, run. I think th there should be a command line way to say convert a gem to an RPM and have it actually work. Um, consistently, so that you can just feed it a bunch of gems so, so at various RPM. versions, and it just does but, the conversion. But they're missing. Or, no, actually, RPM doesn't have some features. They work, but the problem is then you, on top of that, you have these human-imposed root guidelines yeah. that say, well, now not only that, but now I have to update it, and I have to attach the history. You know, I have to change different parts of it, um, and so you end up with these like merging. Like I got to merge into existing RPM. Yeah, it's easy to make for it. a lot of these requirements. Oh, of course, but like it just. The, when all this stuff was designed and made, people were not expecting you would have 12 different versions of the same library and all. That's actually kind of bad for security reasons and other reasons. But people want to move that fast, so that has to sort of happen to be allowed. So we have to hopefully discourage that. Hopefully say you should all use this version of thing because it's stable. But at the same time, make this possible so that you don't have to make 200,000 RPMs. But there's other stuff you have to do with the the RPM spec, though, right? Yeah. yeah. I'm saying manual stuff like adding change logs. Well, you can template mm -hmm. that and generate that, though. That that you can do, right? It's hard. <laughs> Not every gem has the same change log format. No, but like, so I have like an like you know one of my projects, right? So I have like other modules that I've made RPMs for with difficulty. But like, so but the spec file is like dot in templated, and so. I run my make file to build that thing. It's not so but it's pretty easy. Um, Git log with a special format appends to the end of that thing with a change log for the spec file and runs RPM VA. So that's all doable. That's not the challenge. The challenge is RPM itself, like you said, not wanting multiple versions installed. Mm -hmm. And like, how do you do this on your machine? Do the dependency schemes, like, I don't know, the Dependency declarations in <coughs> in gems mapped to dependency declarations in RPM almost. Yeah, they're, they're close. close. They're close. Okay. Yeah. But that's the unfortunate is one assumes or and the other one assumes and, so it just isn't. Yeah. yeah. That kind of makes sense. Yeah. It's a core engineering <coughs> problem that someone who's strong with Ruby, strong with RPM, strong with one. Um, the, the, the security rules and reasonings needs to sort of hopefully sit down and fight until it's done. Yeah, and not it. <laughs> yeah. Also, oh yeah, familiar with pain, pain is one of those. <laughs> but RPM, they kind of punched it. They said, wait, Ruby wants to run how fast? Like, RPM, let's have these, the distribution last 10 years. Like, maintaining Ruby for 10 years doesn't make sense. So you have this running, they couldn't match it, so they said, okay, let's create a different bucket and store it in a software collection library because the core, the, the RPM world can't run like this. So we already kind of changed our rules and said, okay, you're the fast runners and you're the slow. Yeah, yeah. I hear you. All right, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.